So I'd like to talk about subjectivity, uh, resistance and aesthetics. I have probably more slides or too many slides, so I'll probably skip some of the sky slides. And uh, if you think about the term subjectivity, you of course realize that uh, this is a topic that is not covered in traditional psychology or mainstream psychology and arguably one could make the statement that this should be actually the generic subject matter of psychology. Uh, and what is also astonishing is of course that there is no theory of subjectivity in traditional psychology. Uh, and so I'm interested, as was mentioned before, in a theory of subjectivity. And from there, I'm going to move then, so to say, to aesthetics and resistance. So I start out with a broad overview on how I envision <coughs> subjectivity. <coughs> so let's start with a, with, a, with a question here. If I were born in a different culture and time, would I have the same subjectivity? So if I were born, I don't know, 12th century, let's go back to the 12th century, 12th century England, <coughs> would I have the same subjectivity as I have now? And my answer is, of course, no, it would not be the same uh, subjectivity because I wouldn't want, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't feel, I wouldn't desire uh, the same things that I want now. Even my own actions, my agency, if you like, would be completely different than it is nowadays. So and this is why I introduced the idea of socio-subjectivity. The idea that one's own subjectivity is embedded in a history, in a culture, and in a society. And so, of course, when we talk about subjectivity, we very often talk about intra-subjectivity. The idea that subjectivity is something inside of me, which is very personal, and yes, maybe yeah, what a lot of stuff that traditional psychology does is basically intersubjectivity. How is my cognition? How is my personality? How are my emotions? How are my motivations? Uh, and intersubjectivity is, of course, a, a level above because we would take into account the dialogue, the conversations, the interchange between two people and more people in constituting subjectivity. So I would say psychoanalysis, for example, yes, focuses on intersubjectivity and intersubjectivity to a certain degree but they would not focus on socio-subjectivity. And that's why I introduced the idea of socio-subjectivity as an element of subjectivity. So if this is true, that if I would be completely different, if I were born in 12th century Japan, then we have to account for that reality in a concept. And so, of course, this is completely connected. That's a tool, a cognitive tool or a heuristic tool to make sense of what's going on in a person's subjectivity. It's connected, but I think it's important to introduce the idea of socio-subjectivity. This is what I mean by the nexus. There's a connection between those. My own subjectivity is related, of course, to my peers, parents, friends, dialogues, conversations that I have, but it's also connected to a culture and a time I live in. And this is what I mean by socio-subjectivity. And yes, there's different ver uh, explanations for this. You could go back to Hegel, Vico. Uh, you can go back to Marx or Vygotsky. Language would be a good example, of course, in Vygotsky, uh, Vygotsky's case. Something that is outside external becomes internal. Of course, if I were born in Japan, I would speak Japanese. If I were born, I don't know, in, in France, I would speak French. If I were born in Chile, I would speak uh, Spanish. So, and then it becomes an internal uh, element. So, Vygotsky would be one uh, uh, case uh, to make that uh, point. And I think another point for theory of subjectivity is, and I think so I read this in a student paper, you also have to, you cannot only include the mind, you also have to include the body in a theory of subjectivity. And I don't mean the mechanical body, but also the phenomenologically experienced body. So, it has to be the mind and the body, so we cannot take the body away from a theory of subjectivity. So this is, a, uh, yeah. So definitions are not so important, and I'm going to go through all the complexities of definitions. Uh, a generic definition would be subjectivity is a first person uh, um, uh, perspective. That's how it's traditionally defined, first person perspective. 
first person perspective uh, or first person experience. I prefer actually the term first person standpoint. For me this is a little bit more precise because I think that perspective has too many cognitive perceptual connotations and, and a subjectivity can be more than an experience as well. So it's not just uh, uh, if, uh, so I can have a standpoint as about something which I don't have an immediate uh, experience and so I prefer for, uh, for a variety of reasons the term st uh, standpoint, first person standpoint, that's what I mean by subjectivity as a generic definition and this can be of course you can be aware of your standpoint or you can be unaware of your standpoint so I would I guess uh, uh, um, uh, you know acknowledging psychoanalytic uh, thought that you can be of course unaware of your own standpoint. Now critical disability studies has of course made the point that standpoint is a ableist notion. So if you're in a wheelchair you don't you are not standing uh, and so they use the term sit point instead of standpoint. And you could make the argument well very often I don't have a standpoint uh, I don't have a completely idea about something well, maybe it's a move point, a process of developing a standpoint in interactions with other and in personal reflection or in personal reflection. But this is less important to me how we define it. I think we have an idea what I mean by subjectivity. First person standpoint would be a generic uh, definition for that. So what, co what constitutes subjectivity? It's different from what influences subjectivity. What constitutes subjectivity is, of course, <coughs> so we must have some kind of nature, what has been called a societal nature of human beings that enables uh, subjectivity, that enables some uh, things such as a first person standpoint. And societal nature is different from social nature. So I make a distinction between social and societal. <coughs> Animals are social. Ants are social, bees are social. Uh, so animals are in, in principle social beings as well. We are social beings but we are also societal beings, meaning we have the ability to live and participate in societies. Uh, and that makes us different, so to say, from animals, although I know this is sort of a difficult topic as well. Uh, but I think that what, 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 what constitutes subjectivity is actually our societal uh, nature. And on the other hand you have processes of individualization so if you think historically I use the only one example Norbert Elias the process of civilization maybe not the best terminology is a process of individualization. So why is psychology, why is psychology so popular in the 20th century and the 21st century? You know very few people are interested in psychology in the 19th century why has it become such a popular subject? Well, it reflects also a historical transformation of, of culture, of society, with a more focus on the individual, more focus on individual mental life. And that also is sort of the source why we are interested in uh, subjectivity. Uh, so, when we talk about society, I would say, and that's a Holtz-Kampian argument, we are not determined by society but we have because we also have the ability to change societal conditions we have the ability to make societal conditions so it's not an environmentalism when I say what constitutes subjectivity or society no it's not that we are determined by society the society sets the premises for our own subjectivity so societal conditions do not determine who we are but sets the premises for our own actions. I'm not sure if this is completely clear but it's not like you know here's society it completely determines who I am uh, it sets the premises against which I can react also premises that I actually can uh, change which is part I think of a theory of subjectivity. I develop also the idea of socio-intentionality I don't want to really discuss that today but it's the idea that a lot of things that we do is actually related to societal uh, realities. So think about suicide. Suicide could be, oh, it's a personal decision, but of course, as we know from Durkheim, it's also, of course, a, a, a social societal uh, condition. 
And in that sense, again, you see the nexus between socio-subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and intrasubjectivity. So intrasubjectivity is what very often people consider to be subjectivity, inner life, but my argument is that subjectivity is much more than inner life. And what is another problem, if I develop a theory of subjectivity of inner life, psychoanalysis, uh, developed in one culture cannot automatically be exported. So, uh, if you develop a theory, turn of the century Vienna, how can it be automatically exported around the world? if it's the fact that subjectivity is not only intrasubjectivity but related to intersubjectivity and socio-subjectivity. So Fanon, of course, made this argument that uh, certain psychoanalytic concepts don't make sense in the context he was operating. Uh, there's also uh, a nexus between societal changes, inner life and relational life for looping effects. So looping effects is the idea, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, that if somebody calls you something in terms of a psychological category, you understand yourself through those categories. And so if somebody calls some if if somebody calls somebody a moron, which used to be a technical terminology at the beginning of the 20th century in the United States based on intelligence testing, it has it affects, so to say, the inner subjectivity as well. This is what is meant by looping effects, that you have a loop between a psychologist developing a concept and the individual responding to that concept, either agreeing or disagreeing. In either way, uh, there is, so to say, a relationship between the discipline of psychology and how we can think about subjectivity. And I think I use here the example suicide. So if you think about suicide, yes, it's inner life, but it's also obviously uh, 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 socio-historical life. So in Canada, we know, for example, that indigenous peoples have a much higher suicide rate. So you can't just understand it in terms of pure in internal dynamics. You could say the same thing about obsessions or sexual fantasies or even school shootings in the United States. There's always a nexus between the, the, the intrasubjectivity, intersubjectivity, and socio-subjectivity. Tempor temporality is important uh, because, of course, subjectivity changes over time. So, historically, individually, between people, temporality obviously always plays a role when it comes to uh, subjectivity. You could say that it's more a philosophical assumption, subjectivity is unique, the interaction between socio-subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and intrasubjectivity, and the meaning that I give those experiences makes subjectivity also <coughs> unique. So even if you grow up in the same culture, obviously, you, every, don't everybody has the same subjectivities. So subjectivity in that sense is unique, and you could make a metaphysical argument in that sense also irreplaceable. So once you know, subjectivity dies, that you will not recreate exactly the same subjectivity ever. So in that sense, subjectivity is irreplaceable. If you have a clone of yourself, that would not be the same subjectivity as you have. It's, it would be the clone subjectivity, which would not be identical with my own subjectivity. So in that sense, subjectivity is unique and you have a certain uh, unity as uh, Antonia and Anders have pointed out in the article on self and aesthetic uh, effect, there is actually a certain unity to the self, there's a certain unity to subjectivity before we can talk basically about fragmentation. So I said, you know, society constitutes subjectivity, but of course you cannot neglect physics, body, biology, whatever you want to call it obvious biological factor impact subjectivity. So this is different what constitutes subjectivity to what influences subjectivity. So if, if you have Alzheimer, obviously it's going to impact your subjectivity. If you use drugs, it's going to impact your subjectivity. If you age or maturation when it comes to children, changes subjectivity. But even then, 
in cases of reduced intrasubjectivity, intersubjectivity and sociosubjectivity still play a role. So if you have Alzheimer or Alzheimer in a, in a society or culture with very limited facilities, then your subjectivity will be different if you have an enhanced uh, context for living, so to say, with the disease of Alzheimer. And, and then I say the mechanical body and the phenomenologically experienced body impact uh, subjectivity. So a uh, theory of subjectivity needs uh, to include the body. And now you can make the argument, what about technology? Is technology just a tool or instrument or has technology become to a point, some people have argued that, that it actually also constitutes subjectivity. It not only influences subjectivity, but it constitutes subjectivity. Surveillance technologies, I mean that's Foucault's famous example of course, uh, constitute subjectivity. Uh, information technology, Facebook, how does that influence or is it, uh, subjectivity, biotechnologies, how do they influence uh, uh, subjectivity. This is of course also important in a theory of subjectivity. And finally you could make the argument, what about, uh, you know, what about, does, does such a phenomenon such as climate change impact uh, subjectivity? You could make the argument, yes. So some people say they don't, they don't want to have children anymore because of climate change. Well, obviously then it impacts your first person standpoint if this is the case. Uh, income inequality, th that's an interesting case because of course income inequality is an example of, of uh, what I call socio-subjectivity that, that we know from massive amounts of empirical work that uh, income inequality has a negative effect on mental health and the question is how does this work that countries with higher income inequality have more mental health problems, how does this actually work within a subject? A subject doesn't say, no, uh, I, I, I decide to have more mental health problems. Uh, uh, it, is, it is constituted through uh, income inequality uh, that actually impacts uh, also uh, subjectivity. So this is some of the, this is, would be a framework for a theory of subjectivity. And I think what's important also Another element for a theory of subjectivity is not only what happens in human subjectivity, but also what is possible in human subjectivity. So, what it would be an internal example, poetry. Who can write poetry? Well, poetry, we, most of us don't write poetry, I assume, or well, most people I know don't write poetry, but of course it's a possibility of human subjectivity. So we could take a course on poetry and then start writing poetry. So poetry, even if it's not part of my subjectivity, writing poetry, it is a possibility of human subjectivity. And so I think a theory of subjectivity doesn't only look at what happens, which is of course empirical, this and this and this and this happens to human subjectivity, but also what is possible in human subjectivity. And you could say, well, it's, I, I've observed that people are tapped to things, fine, but resistance is also possible. So resistance will be a possibility of human subjectivity. So I, so I don't know many people who resist, but it's at least a possibility of uh, human subjectivity. And, the, and this is where art comes in for me. Art as a possibility of resistance, by either creating art or consuming art. And so I make again a distinction here. Well, what kinds of resistances are possible? Well, it's Art can help in the resistance in the political and economic <coughs> domain, in the interpersonal domain, and in the personal domain. But again, so to say, I make this idea that it's not just related to the personal domain, it's obviously also can relate to interpersonal domain and finally to the political and economic uh, domain. So if somebody asks you what is the purpose of art, I just didn't do an exhaustive list, uh, there's lots of possibilities. Uh, what the purpose of art is, I say, celebration, beautification, somebody wants to have a nice, uh, I don't know, uh, yard. Uh, distinction, of course, that would be Bourdieu's argument, uh, you know, I go to operas and I go to galleries because it cements my membership of a class. 
So if I'm part of the upper classes, so I have to go to opera house or something. So that would be distinction. Investment, people buy art because it makes more money. It's a good investment opportunity. <coughs> then, of course, expression, experience of beauty, pleasure, the sublime, uh, shock, feelings, creativity. You can say, well, I use art for educational purposes. I want to educate people emotionally, intellectually, <coughs> or morally. I want to imagine alternatives. Use art for propaganda, control of the masses, entertainment, research, art-based research. So that has become more popular. I'm not sure how familiar with that. There's now several books out there, articles to use art in research. Health. Some people have argued that art helps people's well-being. So some you say there's no purpose at all. Uh, and of course, uh, art is not restricted to a resisting uh, purpose. I just have this focus here on the resisting purpose of art. And you can have, of course, many more other suggestions if you like. So that's not an <coughs> exhaustive list, there's just a few examples. Art has the capacity to shape and alter our minds. And there is no theoretic limit to what can become the object of an aesthetic experience. I have an example for you. Wim Delvoy. Does anybody know Wim Delvoy? He's a Belgian artist, an artist from Belgium. He became famous for his cloaca. He basically, he went to, in Belgium they like to eat good food. Uh, he went to fine restaurants. He bought that food, he put it in here, and at the end, feces comes out. It's actually technologically difficult. It's not easy to do. So uh, it required some kind of technological expertise to do that. And he, I mean, he's a really famous artist in Europe and North America. He goes to the, he had exhibitions in the top museums in New York City, in Toronto, in Paris, in London, everywhere. And then at the end, uh, you have feces, and he puts this into vacuum packed uh, uh, plastic uh, sheets and sells it for a few thousand euros, also expensive. <laughs> uh, and this is an example of, you know, uh, you know, what is, you know, what is the purpose of art? But, I mean, he might have some ideas. I mean, he, he gives some explanations why he does that. But obviously, the interpretation is not uh, determined by, uh, you know, what we assume is just uh, the purpose of this is to show that uh, art can also be shit, if you want, literally. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, and then he makes variations of that. He uses like a Superman logo, cloaca, cloaca number five. Uh, he has a travel set. A, he calls it travel set, uh, where you you know you put we can travel with it and the same effect. Uh, 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 and um, yeah, the, I, I guess a cleaning product in in I'm not sure if this is known here, but that's a reference to that. And later he, 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 I mean, he's a pretty prolific artist. He, he went, uh, he, he started to tattoo pigs. And he thinks the skin of a pig is very similar to the skin of a human being. That's Wim Delvoye. And uh, obviously you can imagine it was difficult to do that in Belgium. And so he had to go to China to tattoo the pigs. And actually he, in, in his own accord, in his own accord he says that, uh, He's actually a vegetarian, so he doesn't eat the pigs. And he argues that the pigs are actually treated very well, with the exception, I guess, of the tattooing, because he doesn't kill them. He lets them live out their natural life. Uh, and once they die, then he takes off the skin and sells uh, the, uh, the skin. So this is some of the motives that he uses. Christian motives, spiker gang motives, uh, uh, later on Chinese uh, motives. Uh, and that is another project, uh, what he does. So this is not ne necessarily uh, you know, related to resistance, uh, but I guess it's related to the idea of you know, what is actually the purpose of art and stimulating thinking about this uh, phenomenon. So I don't want to go through all this. I want to go through all these theories, I guess. I mean, the theorists also thought about what is the purpose of art. And Immanuel Kant's argument was basically that art has its own domain independent of ethics uh, versus Karama argued that, uh, uh, that 
connected even to epistemology, that there is truth in art. What Karama does not see is the commercial aspect of art, which is, of course, what Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno do. Uh, uh, Adorno Horkheimer, I'm sure if you discussed this book, uh, wrote a book called Dialectic of Enlightenment. And the basic idea is that uh, enlightenment turned into its opposite, which is a negative dialectical move. So you start out with a good idea and it ends up in the opposite. And so they use the example of positivism. So positivism started out with some good ideas in the sense of we don't just want people sitting in their armchairs and discussing issues of empirical reality. We actually want to go out into empirical reality and find uh, the facts about this reality. So you could say there was, a, there was an interesting idea and then it turned into its opposite, that's the argument, where it became a mythology itself. If you say you only can do science in a positivistic way, then it becomes a new mythology and it turns into its opposite. They said the same about ethics, that, uh, that uh, you know, ethics started out with, or, 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 you know, the Kantian ideal of ethics was actually a really positive way of thinking about moral issue. The idea that things should be generalizable and not particular. But, uh, but they argue that nobody in a capitalist economy would act the way a Kantian would act. So if you're just interested in profit and, 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 and money, well, uh, you would laugh at the Kantian who says, we have to think about the generalizability of your principles. And so in ethics, it turns into its opposite. And also when it comes to art, they said this, this mass production of art would lead to this opportunity in, in educating masses, in cr uh, contributing to freedom and to liberation and it turned exactly into its opposite into entertainment and actually defrauding the masses. So that's what I mean by a negative dialectical uh, movement. And it has been reduced to amusement in capitalist uh, societies and it becomes the opposite, it becomes <coughs> numbing. And of course, would you, and I mentioned this before, made the argument that art, uh, that art, um, is a, is a sign of distinction. So Bourdieu, who studied empirically as well, French society in the 60s, observed that uh, you know, the French upper classes used art as a way of distinguishing themselves from the uh, lower classes. And uh, so he emphasized, I guess, that aspect when it comes to art. The context in which this takes place is what I call the psychological humanities. <coughs> so in the English language you say psychological sciences. Psychologists like to emphasize how much they are part of the natural sciences. And what I'm calling for is again sort of a return to the psychological humanities. And I've seen in some of the papers that I read that this is exactly happening. It's a much closer, closer alignment to philosophy history, anthropology, social, sociology, uh, educational theory, arts, <coughs> then it is actually to the natural sciences. So if this trend in psychology, aligning yourself with the psychological sciences, meaning you know, biology, medicine, neuroscience, what I'm calling for is also that if you want to understand subjectivity, you need also much more close alignment with the psychological humanities. It's not completely a new idea because it goes back to the 19th century, but uh, I think it has been lost to, to make this explicit call how psychology should be closely aligned to the humanities and the arts and not necessarily to the natural sciences, which are important for understanding some foundations. But when it comes to subjectivity, if that is really of interest to you, subjectivity, you need, so to say, the information that is developed by the humanities. So this was mean psychological humanities. You look at the perspectives, the materials, the methods of the humanities, the arts, and the concept-driven social sciences, which allows actually much, a much better theory of subjectivity than I think uh, a focus on medicine or biology. I could even make the argument that uh, you could develop a general suture theory of subjectivity. Suture theory 
is a concept that comes actually from psychoanalysis. But the idea again, how can we relate socio-subjectivity and intersubjectivity and intrasubjectivity? The fact that we ourselves stitch ourselves into a context. We are very much agents in stitching ourselves into a society and culture rather than somebody forces us uh, to become part of a culture. So, I mean, Foucault had, of course, a similar insight that it's us who are authentically searching out, uh, you know, our own uh, subjectivity to a certain degree. It's a little bit more complicated, but that it's not, again, that, you know, that society forces you to do certain things, but actively you stitch yourself into the perspectives, demands, practices, habits of a society. So you could do a, theory, a general theory or a suture theory of subjectivity, I think, also to make that more clear. Uh, I don't want to idealize the arts. They participate in a neoliberal market uh, that embodies contradictions and they often support the status quo as well. So if you think about the art market, think about academic market. Yes, academic ma market, you, you find in terms of income differences, you're going to find income differences. But if you think about the art world between, so to say, a poor artist and a rich artist, you have much, like, much larger uh, income inequalities in the art world than anywhere else. It's, it's enormous, so to say. If you think about a, a, a superstar in music and then think about a, a musician who plays, let's say, in a bar, those income differences are enormous. So I'm not idealizing the arts. I, I like the arts because I think it allows us to overcome intersubjectivity. Uh, that's one element, because you might have to engage with other people, you can discuss with other people, and you might have to relate it to a larger culture and society. Uh, I'm worried about the limitations of conscientization, Paulo Freire's term, intellectual education and enlightenment. So the question is, for resistance, what is the be best means for talking, thinking, addressing uh, resistance? Is it really the classroom with, you know, I don't know, two-hour lectures, three-hour lectures, or are there other means of uh, engaging the attention and the subjectivity of, uh, of people? I mean, that is, the, is an interesting question to me. And I think we're very long focused, as academics especially, on conscientization, on intellectual education, and on enlightenment. And maybe there's other ways in engaging, so to say, the public in terms of resistance, rather than just uh, those uh, intellectual means. So this, that becomes a possibility of uh, art as a tool. And art as a source for resisting agency which is maybe pre-linguistic, pre-conscious, and maybe even pre-conceptual. And so there is this long history, uh, just one example, it's not an important example, uh, where we privilege cognition in education and when it comes to talking about resistance. And it's basically the idea that it always has to be cognitive and conceptual. And the question is, so does the, are there other means uh, available? And so injustices, let's move from, I, I, li I prefer to talk about injustice over justice. So in the North American context, people talk a lot about social justice. Uh, if you come from a critical tradition, I'm interested more in injustices because I think it's easier to identify injustices than to identify uh, what is justice. So if I see an injustice, I think that's much easier to identify than uh, what constitutes actually a, a, a justice. And obviously, injustice can take place in the economic and political sphere. Uh, they can take place in the area of representation, recognition, and interaction. And they can take place with, within subject, subjectification. Uh, um, let's say I have compulsions. Uh, then, uh, uh, and they, they might be constituted socio-subjectively. But uh, I made experiences, so to say, is, is, is problematic for myself, and I want to overcome those uh, compulsions. <coughs> and again, so I'm, I'm suggesting not only focusing on those, which is what often clinical psychology does, but connecting those uh, areas. Because art is subjective, many examples reflect my own background. Uh, so 
it's a little bit difficult uh, uh, because I'm not familiar, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with some of the examples I'm showing you, but uh, in the in because art is in a sense uh, 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 subjective or expresses subjective experiences, the examples that I'm choosing are also reflecting personal experiences. So I'm ta talking a little bit about Peter Weiss as a German novelist. He wrote a book called The Aesthetics of Resistance. It's a novel and he traces basically the experiences of working class teenagers in fascist Germany in the 1930s. What they basically do, these teenagers, they appropriate mainstream art through the perspective of uh, working class uh, teenagers. And so this is the Alta of Bergamon, that's in Berlin. It's a very famous uh, museum in Germany or in Europe. And it's basically originally located in Asia Minor, Bergamon, now, nowadays Turkey, and was brought to Germany in the 19th century and set up in a museum. And what you have in this Alta is basically what is called Titanomachia, the struggle between the Greek gods and the Titans, to say it simple. And maybe you're familiar with that because there were a few movies in the last decades about the struggle of the Greek gods and the Titans. In this specific case, Athena is struggling with a Titan and she tries to pull him out from the earth to which he is connected and in doing so can overcome her opponent. And, uh, and of course, uh, this has been a very important monument in German history because the Nazis, the German Nazis hosted the Olympic Committee in this museum and the German Nazis considered themselves inher inheritors of classical Greek uh, culture. And so how do we appropriate such a museum? If, 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 if you are a working class uh, teenager. And Gombrich in his you know, overview book on the story of art says the clumsy giants are overwhelmed by the triumphant gods look up in agony and frenzy. So usually if you come from a European culture you would identify with the Greek gods and not with the Titans. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's seen so to say as the real ancestors of European culture. What Weiss's protagonists do in this, they identify with the opposite. They identify exactly with the Titans. So they don't identify themselves anymore with the Greek gods. You know, Ap uh, Apollo being this, you know, perfect featured male representative of humanity. They identify exactly with the, <coughs> with the Titans and, <coughs> and so to say the defeated ones and, and argue that Hercules, who basically could have saved the day for the Titans, sided on the side of uh, the Greek gods, and which led to victory. So what, he, what they try to do is mainstream art, appropriating a museum, a mainstream art, from the perspective of the working classes, which I then interpret as a, as a source uh, of uh, resistance or mainstream art becoming a source of resistance. Even art that is in museums, even art that is in, 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 in you know, classical uh, buildings can be appropriate for, for uh, resisting purposes. That's my point here. Okay, that's the raft of the Medusa. What's the story here? Uh, the raft of the Medusa, a 19th century event, it's very similar. Raft of the Medusa is basically a sinking of a French naval ship. Uh, and what happened is that the upper classes were saved and the lower classes basically had to, had to linger on this raft and many of them died. They reverted to cannibalism. Uh, and, <coughs> and of course, it's a symbol again of, of, of class division, something that could easily be solved, a problem that could easily be solved, well, build a ship where you have enough raft boats, uh, is not solved and uh, is solved in a way that uh, it, it, it completely disadvantages, leads to the uh, uh, termination basically of, of, of poor people on the ship. Um, we can't relate very much, I guess, anymore to a 19th century painting, but what is more popular, at least in, I guess, North American culture is Titanic. 
can use the Titanic from the 20th century as a similar example of what class divisions actually mean. What, the, what are the actually consequences uh, of, of class division? And people have actually used the Titanic to talk about class differences in uh, society. This is a Canadian example. And I think you can here see the nexus between, uh, the nexus between, you know, um, resistance in the political sphere, resistance in the economic sphere, resistance when it comes to recognition and resistance when it comes to personal lives. Uh, uh, we, if, uh, these are indigenous artists in Canada. They had to struggle to make a living. Indigenous art in Canada was not recognized as art. So until the 1960s, people said what indigenous artists do is basically craftsmanship or something. Crafts, handicrafts, that's not really art what they're doing. Uh, there was a standard of, in Canada, there was also a standard of European art being the standard. And if you don't follow European trends, that is not really art. And so they had to struggle indeed, so to say, to, to being able to sell their art, to go to galleries, to go to museums, to have exhibitions, which is much more on a economic and political level. They had to go to governments and say, no, we want to participate in that. Uh, uh, they had to negotiate. It's a question of recognition. How do we recognize people? How do we recognize indigenous artists? And it's, of course, it redefines the native art and identity. So they were able to assume the identity of a native artist. And so I'll give you one example. This is a, it's a stamp now in Canada. And so that would be one example of uh, Naval Morisot, an artist, uh, the type of art that they produce. And obviously it takes, I guess, takes some uh, experience. Uh, and now it's pretty much recognized as art. But it took, it took, what, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years to be recognized as uh, Canadian art and not following a European art uh, tradition. <coughs> For me, this is an example of resistance where you have exactly this nexus where you have to fight in the political domain, the economic domain, you have to fight for recognition and you have to fight, so to say, to make your own living as a native artist. It's an American example, uh, Guerrilla Girls. Uh, and the, again, think of a similar uh, nexus. It's, it's, it's about recognition, it's about, so to say, being able uh, to make a living as an artist. It's about uh, women as uh, as artists, being recognized as artists, it's about identity. And so they ask, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, 85% of the nudes are female. And they change, if you go onto the webpage, they change these numbers. So this has changed, I think this started out the first time, what was in the 70s. And so they change the numbers here, uh, how, how about the percentages. But this is a more recent example. Uh, so it's still 5% only, 85% of the nudes are female. So they, that is a form of using art as a form of uh, resistance, but I think also where the nexus is connected. Weiwei, a Chinese artist, window crank, it's probably much more on the political domain. <coughs> Why would somebody make a window crank out of uh, class and show that as a piece of art? There's, of course, the story behind it. The story is that during the... Um, meeting of the Communist Party in Beijing, China, uh, people would use taxis and they would drop out leaflets from the taxis. So they would crank down the windows and they would throw out leaflets. The Chinese Communist Party, of course, uh, disallowed that. So the, the, the cranks were taken off and people couldn't throw leaflets out of their windows anymore during the time when they had the uh, Congress. And so Weiwei uses that and puts it sort of as a symbol of of, 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 of resistance. Window crank becomes a symbol of resistance when it comes uh, 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 you know, to political domination in a specific country. This is much more subjective, I guess. Uh, Weiwei, sh you know, he, he shows you the middle finger in front of famous, it's not only the four buildings, like I think 25 buildings, uh, Opera House, uh, Shanghai, London, and it uh, Rome. Uh, you always shows the fingers of disrespect for sort of the, the things that we have to revere and celebrate uh, uh, in mainstream culture and he thinks, you know, he use, calls the study on perspective where obviously a different meaning of what perspective is. Diego Rivera is an interesting case. Uh, this is in the Rocke, it's a Rockefeller mural. And so Diego Rivera uh, painted that. 
I think he had, where is it? He had Lenin in the painting. He was commissioned and it was destroyed because Rockefellers didn't want Lenin in a mural. So then it was completely uh, destroyed. It's just one example. <coughs> this is in my university. <coughs> so you have a Palestinian young man, I guess, uh, standing there. He looks at bulldozers going over fields. He doesn't do any violence, actually. He just ponders it. And uh, uh, a donor asked uh, the painting to be removed from the university. Uh, and the university refused. And uh, the donation stops. So this is you know, how you have influence from money of determining what people can draw in terms of art. It's another example. There's, of course, a famous example. Uh, this is from the 60s, connecting the atom bomb to the female body. And this is, uh, this is another classic example. Hans Hake in 1917 asked, would the fact that Governor Rockefeller has not denounced President Nixon's Indochina policy <coughs> be a reason for you, as a mistake here, not voting for him in uh, November? And he put this in the MoMA, a Museum of Modern Art in New York City, exactly in the context where um, Rockefeller was on the board of governors of this museum. And so he put it in and he did a poll, literally a poll, and people could vote in the museum. And I guess the majority of the museum's visitors said uh, they would not vote for him. But uh, you know that's an act of resistance, clearly. It's another example. This is Anselm Kiefer. It's a pretty famous German artist. And he started out his career with the Hitler Cruz. And I mean, it shows you that one and the same gesture doesn't have always the same meaning. I mean, he, his, his question was, you know, how can you be a German artist after 1945? After German fascism, how can you still be an artist? How is it possible to do art after 1940, 1945 in Germany? And in that context, it's about German identity, being a German artist. And so this would relate to much more the questions of uh, something that seems to be the opposite of what it uh, denotes. It connotes ob obviously something different. And uh, it's, it's about questions of uh, identity and resisting that, as you can imagine. Uh, had a hard time uh, presenting that uh, paintings in in uh, uh, Germany at the time. This is Doris Salcedo. She goes to the Tate Modern in London and she puts a crack into the Tate Modern in the concrete and she calls it Shipoleth, which is a biblical story. A biblical story according to which how do you recognize the foreigner. And there were tribes, I guess, uh, Israeli tribes, and one tribe was distinguished because they couldn't pronounce certain uh, vowels, I think it was. And, uh, and her, her, but what she tries to say is, uh, if you have an accent in Europe, or in England in this case, you're always going to be dis identifiable as a foreigner. And so Shibboleth becomes sort of the hero experience in England also, in other countries, uh, that distinguishes the foreigner from the non-foreigner. And, uh, and then the, this is a photo later. They uh, closed it in again, but uh, it's a very simple piece of art where you can talk about, uh, where you can talk about an accent always distinguishing you and always identifying you as a, as a foreigner. So skip literature, movies. Yeah, I mean the question is then, I, what does is street art a different way of escaping the neoliberal market of art? Uh, and so, pondering that a little bit, so, so a thesis would be: the less money is involved in art, the higher the resisting affordance is. Doesn't mean that neoliberal market cannot produce great art, but 
the resisting affordances, I mean, seem to be given if there's less money uh, involved. Money leads also division between with and within producers and consumers about. And so then you can ask, uh, is street art, is street art uh, promising? This is from Valparaiso, Capitalismo is Terrorismo. This is from London, Endless Worship. <coughs> you see Pietà, uh, you know, Mary with Jesus and carrying uh, designer bags, I guess. Kill all artists in Venice. What I'm interested in particular, what I mentioned before, is indeed, so to say, first of all, uh, an interesting understanding of injustice in the socio-subjective field. Because I think the, I mean, th that was, if that is the take home message basically, that subjectivity is not related only to the internal. It's not only related to the interpersonal. It has to take into account larger social structures and the question is, can we change understanding of those injustices in the socio-subjective field through art and also moving to a certain degree away from the subject actually to injustices and uh, resistances and well problems your celebrities now in street art as well Banksy of course would be a good example and so redefinition of the sublime the ability to reflect and feel an excess of injustice that finds socio-subjectivity, intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity. So that's basically the take-home message. Uh, and I think that was it because 55 minutes, uh, I think, is enough time. Okay, thank you.